Hello, everyone, and welcome back. I'm Joe Chappelle, and you're listening to episode 45 of the OBGYN podcast. Before we get started today, I just wanted to thank everyone who has joined the Slack. I really think that we are starting to reach critical mass there. And remember, that it is really a place for all of you to get in contact with people who do what you do all over the world. So please use it and help me make it into something truly valuable for our community. If you do want to get on it, just please go to the website and you can find the link. Second, thank you to everyone who has decided to support the show by contributing to the Patreon. It does really help us keep this going, and if you want to help out a little bit, then please, again, head over to the website, obgyn.fm, and click on support. This is going to be even more important for the next few months because I am going to be leaning on my friends here at the podcast, and that's because my wife and I are expecting our second child quite soon. I'm going to do my best to keep the episodes coming, and several of the regulars have offered to step up and put together some shows, but if we miss a week or two here or there, please, uh, I hope you understand. Well, with all that out of the way, let me introduce today's show. Since the beginning of my training, there has always been one diagnosis in pregnancy that both intrigues and frightens me in equal measures. Intriguing because we don't really know what causes it or why some women get it and others don't. And scary because it can lead to stillbirth without any of the warning signs that we have come to depend on. I'm talking, of course, about cholestasis of pregnancy. And today, Dr. Sarah Kim is going to walk us through what we do know about it and what we don't know about it. So without further ado, let's get started with episode 45, Intrahepatic Cholestasis of Pregnancy with Dr. Sarah Kim. We have explored a myriad of topics in obstetrics thus far, and few domains still remain to be explored. One area that piqued my interest are conditions that are present only during pregnancy and seemingly self-resolve after delivery. One of those conditions is Intrahepatic Cholestasis of Pregnancy, or ICP, which is a unique phenomenon observed in obstetrics. It is a condition seen during pregnancy and primarily characterized by maternal pruritus, liver enzyme abnormalities, and elevated bile acid concentrations. And most notably, and likely the most fatal aspect, the sudden and unpredictable death of the fetus. Surprisingly, the condition seems to spontaneously resolve after delivery. But attention is provided to ICP, largely for its fatal consequence and the inability to accurately predict outcome, let alone effectively prevent fatality. While our understanding of ICP has evolved over the years, there is still much unknown about this condition that makes management a bit difficult. As always, looking back into history, we can see the evolution in the understanding of the disease and how its perception has changed over the years. The first recorded observation of an intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy occurred in 1883 by Alfeld, where jaundice resolving after delivery was a predominant sign defining the disease. It was not until the 1950s that pruritus was associated with the condition and more cases were recorded that seemed to fall under similar characteristics. A paper by Fast and Rolston published in 1963 described how the condition was very rare but proceed to also outline diagnostic criteria for what they call idiopathic jaundice of pregnancy. The four criteria the authors mention are 1. Symptoms only during pregnancy with no exposure to hepatitis hepatotoxic drugs, or potential source of serum hepatitis, 2. Presence of pruritus and or jaundice, 3. Demonstration of biochemical abnormalities, suggests of intrahepatic cholestasis, and 4. Percutaneous liver biopsy, which demonstrate presence of intrahepatic cholestasis. The clinical presentation FAST and Rolson mention are similar to what we see and associate with ICP today pruritus, jaundice, and high rate of occurrence in subsequent pregnancies. They also mention that there appear to be geographical discrepancies in incidence and that symptoms tend to occur in the third trimester, something we also observe today. A rather significant difference, however, is the effects of the condition in that idiopathic jaundice of pregnancy at the time was considered a benign condition with no long-standing consequences for symptoms were known to completely resolve after delivery. Recommendation was to offer reassurance to patients, and focus was on addressing pruritus, which seemed to be the most severe symptom to treat. And importantly, induction of labor was only offered at 38 weeks for quote-unquote very severe pruritus, as it may cause sleep deprivation for the patient. The paper barely mentions impact on the fetus, and in fact, The only risk to the fetus the paper described was the potential to go into premature labor, which was observed in several of the cases. 
The paper concludes by saying that further investigation needs to occur for a better understanding of the disease process. But not seeing the impact ICP had on the fetus demonstrates a limited understanding of the disease process at the time. It is now over 50 years since a publication by Fast and Rolson. So what more do we know about intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy? As mentioned before, intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy is defined mostly by intense pruritus and lab abnormalities, most commonly in liver enzymes and or bile acid elevation. The incidence of ICP tends to differ geographically, ranging from 0.1 to 15%. It is most common in South America, specifically Chile, whereas in Europe, the incidence tends to be lower, around 1%. So the geographical differences observed previously back in the day is also observed today. Symptoms usually begin in third trimester, or greater than 80% presenting after 30 weeks of gestation. Pruritus usually manifests on the palms and soles, but could eventually spread to the rest of the body and in general tends to worsen at nighttime. Lab abnormalities could precede the pruritus or vice versa, so it is unclear of the exact relationship between the symptom and sign of ICP. Some other signs include pale stool, dark urine, steatorrhea, and jaundice. Studies have been performed to find biomarkers that may be the most sensitive and specific to diagnose ICP early, but there does not seem to be one definitive marker that defines ICP. Some laboratory abnormalities that are measured range from elevation of ALT-ASD, direct bilirubin concentration, elevation in serum cholic acid concentration, and most notably, bile acid concentration. Elevation in ALT-ASD is usually indicative of hepatocellular damage, and studies have demonstrated that ALT tends to be slightly more sensitive predictor of ICP. Another potential marker is glutathione S-transferase alpha, which is a detoxification enzyme that is released into circulation following liver damage and have been found to be a better indicator of actual hepatic health than the liver enzymes ALT-ASD. It has not been commonly looked at in ICP, but two recent studies have shown a potential role for early detection of hepatic injury to diagnose ICP. A marker that is commonly associated with intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy and also often offers extent of disease is bile acid level. Bile acids are end products of cholesterol metabolism in the liver. They are usually present in very small amounts in the serum. 95% of bile acids are reabsorbed in the terminal ileum and transported back to portal vein circulation. However, in ICP, there appears to be a dysfunction in the enterohepatic circulation, resulting in increase in bile acid concentration. And whether this phenomenon occurs prior to clinical presentation is unclear at this time. Regardless, Bile acid levels are considered one of the most reliable markers in diagnosis and monitoring of ICP. Unfortunately, it may take several days to result, sometimes making physicians to rely on other findings to guide management at the time of initial encounter, and treatment is often based on clinical symptoms. Of note, other causes of pruritus and liver enzyme abnormalities must be excluded before diagnosing a woman with ICP. Although the diagnosis of ICP has become much more inclusive, as failure to properly identify and diagnose a disease could lead to dire consequences for the fetus. So then, how is the fetus affected? For one, meconium staining of amniotic fluid has been noted to be higher in fetuses affected by ICP. The incidence of normal pregnancy is about 15%, and usually is an indication of fetal distress. In ICP, the incidence has been noted to be as high as 58% in all cases affected by ICP in 100% of cases that result in intrauterine demise. In some cases, there is also fetal heart rate changes, including decreased variability, tachycardia, and fetal arrhythmias. Many are also born preterm. While a lot of these preterm births are iatrogenic secondary induction of labor around 37 to 38 weeks, spontaneous preterm labor has also been observed, the rate of which tends to be around 30 to 40%, although one study saw it as high as 60%. And when preterm birth follows possible complications from it, like respiratory distress syndrome, which again have been found in larger numbers in fetus affected by ICP. The cause of these fetal complications have been explored to better understand and possibly prevent them. Again, bile acids seem to be the culprit as elevated bile acid concentrations have also been found in fetal amniotic fluid, cord serum, and meconium. In rat cardiomyocytes, exposure to bile acid demonstrated a decrease in rate of contractility, which was reversible after removal of the inciting factor. 
Such a finding, although not demonstrated in humans, could all explain the changes in fetal heart rate, which could be one possible explanation for the cause of sudden intrauterine demise. Also, sheep administered cholic acid, which is a precursor to bile acids, showed a higher incidence of spontaneous preterm labor. So while the rate of preterm delivery is higher in women with ICP due to early induction, this study offers some evidence for those cases that may deliver preterm spontaneously. The most morbid fetal outcome, however, is unpredictable spontaneous fetal demise, which occurs in about 4% of cases. The mortality rate has decreased over the years as a result of more active management, which includes pharmacotherapy, increased fetal monitoring, and induction of labor around 37 to 38 weeks, due to observation that stillbirths tend to occur around 37 to 39 weeks, although it is virtually impossible to predict. Again, the marker that seems to correlate the most with fetal demise is phthalo acid. One study demonstrated that there is 1 to 2% increased risk for every micromole per liter of bile acid increase above 40 micromole per liter. Having this information could help guide management and delivery planning, although fetal demise has occurred in cases with bile acids in the 20s. So again, the unpredictable nature of this disease is what is possibly the most distressing part of it. So then what exactly is the cause of this disease with such possible morbid fetal outcome? The etiology just like predicting outcome, is not as clear. There is some data that suggests genetics may play a role, and the information comes from studying familial syndromes like progressive familial cholestasis and benign recurrent cholestasis. One of the genes studied the most is ABCB4, which encodes multidrug resistance protein 3, an enzyme that transports phosphatidylcholine across liver cells. In short, it helps in transporting materials across hepatocytes, and a mutation in this gene may lead to women developing intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy. The data is conflicting, however, as one study demonstrated a family where all the female relatives that were affected by ICP had ABCB gene, but another study showed no connection between the two. In 2007, Wasmuth and Al found there to be a correlation between ABCB4 and severe IBCP with bile acid levels greater than 40 micromole per liter, we suggested that having this gene not only put women at risk of developing ICP, but a severe variant where bile acid concentrations reach dangerous levels associated with intrauterine demise. Some other genes implicated in this disease include ABCB11, ATP8B1, and FIC1. Most don't have clear data to support it is solely responsible for ICP, but the variety of genes studied and their possible involvement offer the idea of the heterogeneous nature of ICP. An important part of knowing this link of ICP with genetics, though, is a way to figure out how this information could be translated and applied clinically. An additional player in the disease process are hormones. This is supported by the fact that ICP is more common in multigestation pregnancies, or 20% of multigestation pregnancies versus 4% of singleton pregnancies are affected by ICP. It also begins to occur most in the third trimester when progesterone and estrogen levels are the highest. One study injected estrogen to 20 otherwise healthy women and found an increase in serum bile acid concentration, implying that hormones may impair liver function and cause liver enzyme abnormalities. Additionally, looking at umbilical cord serum showed that there is an increase in disulfated progesterone in fetal compartments of affected pregnancies versus normal pregnancies, again suggesting that hormones may play a role in the cause. Environmental factors may also be a cause of ICP. Selenium level and season variation has been shown to correlate with ICP incidence. Dietary selenium intake is lower in Finland and Chile compared to other countries, and women in these countries tend to have higher incidence of ICP. Moreover, cholestasis of pregnancy tends to occur more in winter months, and selenium levels have also been reported to be lower in winter months, which again suggests a possible correlation between winter, selenium levels, and incidence of ICP, all environmental factors. The different factors that may be contributing to ICP show that it is likely a multifactorial process, and so far, one definitive cause has not been identified. We delve into the cause as well as a diagnosis, so time to explore management. As mentioned, there is no cure until delivery, so in the interim, management is aimed at controlling symptoms and reducing fetal distress. The fetus could be monitored by a biophysical profile and NST, although normal fetal movement and testing has been noted in some cases even just several hours before fetal demise. To try and prevent fetal demise, most recommend active management by delivering around 37 to 38 weeks. In the interim, most of the treatment is aimed at symptomatic control for the woman. The first-line treatment is UDCA or ursodiol. 
UDCA is a naturally occurring hydrophilic bile acid and has been used effectively to treat primary biliary cholestasis. UDCA stimulates biliary secretion by regulating bile acid transporters. It also lowers serum levels of ethanol estradiol 17 beta glucuronide, which is a cholestatic metabolite of estrogen. UDCA was first used in intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy in 1992, and randomized controlled trials have shown that treatment with UDCA results in decrease in pruritus and improve in NLFTs. There is data that states that UDCA reduces bile acid levels in core blood, amniotic fluid, and colostrum. However, the bile acid concentration in meconium is not decreased by UDCA, which may indicate that the stress on the baby is not necessarily relieved by the treatment. Overall, it has been demonstrated to offer good symptomatic control and to improve lab values with minimal side effects, so it is considered one of the first sign agents for ICP management. Another possible treatment is administration of dexamethasone. It has been shown to inhibit placental estrogen synthesis by decreasing precursor secretions from fetal adrenal glands. One observational study in Finland demonstrated a decrease in serum estradiol levels with symptomatic improvement. However, the study has not been reproducible, and moreover, the use of dexamethasone in ICP is controversial. Dexamethasone is usually used for fetal lung maturity, but data showing repeated doses can actually have harmful effects to the fetus. So it is an option, but not strongly recommended, and definitely not as first line. Another medication is cholestyramine, an anion exchange resin that acts by binding bile acids in the gut, inhibiting enterohepatic circulation, but it may also deplete the mother of fat soluble vitamins and not cause an improvement in fat level. But it may also deplete the mother of fat soluble vitamins and not cause an improvement in bile acid level. So again, not the best. Lately, S adenosyl L methionine is a compound involved in composition and fluidity of hepatic membranes, influencing biliary excretion of metabolites. It has been shown to prevent elevations in NLTAC, bile acids, and bilirubin and results in symptomatic improvement. There was a study that compared UCDA and S-adenosyl L-methionine, and UCDA was shown to have better improvement symptoms as well as reduction of bile acid levels. Moreover, a double-blind study comparing S-adenosyl L-methionine with placebo did not show any difference from placebo. More studies need to be done to demonstrate its safety and efficacy, but it's something that is being explored as a possible alternative to UCDA. As can be seen, these treatments are aimed at addressing symptoms but have not been necessarily shown to change outcomes, which by nature of the disease is difficult to test as one of the outcomes involves fetal demise. Fortunately, once the pregnancy is over, the patient rarely has any lasting liver damage, although it does put them at risk for recurrence in subsequent pregnancies. Some studies have also demonstrated that having ICP may put women at risk of developing gallstones, pancreatitis, and autoimmune hepatitis in the future. First recorded observation of intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy occurred in 1883, and while advancement in knowledge and management has changed since that time, a lot still remains to be known. Overall, it is prudent not to have this go undiagnosed and to keep ICP in mind when evaluating women for pruritus in pregnancy. While other etiologies must be ruled out, missing ICP could have fatal consequences. Currently, there's a lot of focus on genetics, and many in vitro studies are underway. Hopefully, information could be gathered regarding their role in causing the disease and possibly in prevention of this rare but possibly fatal condition.